Hi, my name is Layla Agarwal, and I'm a medical oncologist at the Norton Cancer Institute. I specialize in the treatment of breast cancer, and I also run a sexual health program for women with cancer. Today, I'll be talking about cancer and sex, sexual health in women with cancer. Here are my disclosures. So let's start by talking about sex and cancer. Why is this important? According to the World Health Organization, sexual health is fundamental to the overall health and well being of individuals, couples, and families, and this is relevant throughout somebody's life. It's very clear that cancer and cancer treatment can negatively impact sexual health through a number of different ways surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, hormone blockers even stem cell transplant can have impacts on sexual health. When we think about sexual health, we think of it as a biopsychosocial model where all of these different domains can impact someone's sexual health and also can cause issues with sexual dysfunction. So talking about biology, people going through cancer and cancer treatment can undergo a lot of changes biologically. And those include hormonal changes, anatomical changes, the loss of a body part, such as the breast or gynecological organs, loss of sensation, for example, of the breast or the nipple when women have mastectomy or breast surgery, pain and fatigue. And there's medical treatments for each of these issues, which can include specialty evaluation, pelvic floor physical therapy, medication, and others. In the psychological domain, when people go through cancer diagnosis and treatment, there is significant impact on emotions, such as uh, causing depression or anxiety and cognition, which involves body image and thinking patterns, as well as motivation and self-efficacy. So here's where treatment options such as psychosocial counseling and cognitive behavioral therapy can come in. In the interpersonal domain, there can be a lot of impact on relationships, communication, intimacy and treatment here can involve couples therapy or supportive group counseling. And then in the cultural, sociocultural domain, religious beliefs, cultural values, social norms all play a factor on an individual's sexual health as well. For women who undergo treatment for cancer, a lot of concerns can come up related to low estrogen symptoms. And this can come about if a premenopausal woman has gone through chemotherapy that induced early menopause. If through surgery or radiation, the, ovary, the ovaries are removed and somebody who still has ovarian function or through hormone blocker pills in the treatment of breast cancer. So some of the symptoms associated with low estrogen affect sexual health. That can include libido, fatigue, joint pain, night sweats, anxiety or depression, pain with sex, vaginal dryness, mood swings. So all of these can impact a person's well-being, including their sexual health. So I've invited Audrey Hepburn to come and join us today and she's wearing beautiful pearls. So she's gonna share some pearls of wisdom with us. So the first one is treatment related sexual health dysfunction is one of the most prevalent and distressing side effects of cancer treatment. How common is this? Long-term sexual health problems are seen in 50% of breast cancer patients 65 to 90% of gynecological cancer patients and 60% of female colorectal cancer patients. One particular symptom, which is pain with sex, can be seen in 45% of breast cancer patients and 55% of patients who have gynecological or rectal cancer. So this is very common and very distressing. There is a recent survey which was published and it looked at 405 cancer patients, the majority were female, 87% reported that cancer treatment had impacted sexual function or desire. 73% reported pain with sex, 53% reported changes in body image, 42% were unable to achieve orgasm. So this really highlights how common these concerns are. And then strikingly, only 27.9% said that they had formally been asked about the sexual health. So you can see from this survey that the majority of our cancer patients may be experiencing concerns with their sexual health, and most of them have not been asked about it. Another striking disparity that came about was that female patients were less likely to have been asked about sexual health compared to male patients in this study where 53% of male patients were asked about sexual health 
versus 22% of female patients. The impact of sexual dysfunction is really significant. Among cancer survivors, sexual health has been rated as the third most common concern, and it can be associated with distress, poor quality of life, and mood disorders. Sexual health problems caused by cancer treatment do not magically disappear. So if these are not asked about and addressed and treated, they will not just go away on their own. Historically, there have been a lot of barriers to sexual health care, and this has been highlighted in some studies that have looked at concerns that come from patients as well as from medical professionals. Patients have raised concern about making the doctor or the medical professional feel uncomfortable, embarrassment, belief that it is the doctor's responsibility to raise the issue, or feeling that sexual health concerns are not valid or, or are untreatable. On the part of medical professionals, there's a feeling that they have been insufficiently trained or skilled. There's discomfort, the perception of a lack of time, limited awareness about interventions, and again, concerns about making patients feel uncomfortable. Um, there's also some assumptions that may be made and limited availability of specialty services for sexual health. Some of the misconceptions about sexual health that are out there is that patients will tell you if they have sexual health concerns. That is not the case. Patients expect to be asked about whether they have sexual health concerns. And numerous studies have shown that even if patients have concerns, only a very small number will actually bring them up unprompted. Another, another misconception is that unmarried patients don't have sexual health concerns or that older patients don't care about sex. Patients with metastatic cancer are too sick to care about sex or that only breast cancer or gynecological cancer patients are affected by this. So I'm bringing the queen herself to say, no, these are not true. And we have to really leave these misconceptions at the door when we're approaching our patients. So luckily um, there's a number of professional organizations that have put out guidelines of how to address sexual problems in people with cancer, including ASCO. And the um, recommendations are um, ones that I'm gonna highlight throughout the next several slides in the talk here. But the recommendations that follow cannot be used unless someone has taken the initiative to ask. So if you walk away from here with um, nothing else from this talk, just keep in mind that you can ask the patients about sexual health. So how do we do this? How do I assess sexual health in the clinic? So I'm gonna go through a number of different techniques for how you can screen or assess sexual dysfunction. And you know, I would, I would challenge you to try some of these different techniques with your patients and see which one seems the most natural and effective to you. The first way is just ask. So just come out and ask, about the, the problem. Do you have any concerns about your sexual health, such as interest in sex, vaginal dryness, or pain with sex? This really establishes that sexual health is a medical concern when it's being asked by a medical professional. It's often helpful to lead with what's called a ubiquity statement, meaning just a blanket statement that says that these um, issues are common. So for example, many patients with breast cancer have changes in their sexual health. Do you have any concerns? Um, then it's really important to follow that with specific questions. When you ask someone this question, it may have been the first time that they've ever been asked about their sexual health and an automatic response might be no, because they haven't thought about it or they haven't thought to discuss it with a medical professional. So it's important to follow up with specific questions such as, have you experienced vaginal dryness? Do you have pain with sex? Have you had changes in your libido that bother you? Another way is to ask in the context of a patient's relationship, and this probably makes the most sense when um, you're doing a social history or uh, meeting a patient for the first time and inquiring about their relationship, family status, and so forth. So are you, a relation, are you in a relationship? Are you sexually active? If so, do you have any concerns? And if they say they're not sexually active, don't leave it there because there might be a problem that has prevented them from being sexually active. So follow with the questions such as, if not, do you have any concerns that may have caused you not to be sexually active? Another really simple way to do it is to incorporate it in a basic assessment, such as a review of systems. So when you're asking about all the different symptoms a patient may be having, include sexual function. Do you have vaginal dryness? Do you have pain with sex? Do you have concerns about your body image? Um, and have you had changes in your libido that bother you? So, um, 
can go over these because we talked about most of those. Another one is called the Plicit model. So this has been around for a long time, since the 70s, and it basically sets up a framework. So first you give the patient permission to raise these issues by making it a medical concern and establishing the legitimacy of this issue. Then provide limited information. Um, at that point, you can follow with specific suggestions and then if needed, refer onward for intensive therapy. So here's an example of how this can be used um, in the cancer clinic for patients with cancer. So to grant permission, use, use a ubiquity statement as we discussed before. So sexual concerns are common among breast cancer patients. Are you having any concerns? Then next comes limited information. For example, the patient is on an aromatase inhibitor. Aromatase inhibitors frequently cause vaginal dryness. Specific suggestion would be using a vaginal moisturizer or a lubricant can help. An intensive therapy, if that doesn't help, I would like you to see your gynecologist or other referral for more intensive therapy. Another method is called the checklist. Five A's, ask, advise, assess, assist, and arrange follow-up. And a checklist has been created um, that I've listed here that can be used in the clinic where patients can fill this out themselves and then turn it into the medical professionals. So um, lots of different methods of how to assess sexual health. And you know, I think that you can find one that works best for your setting and how your um, interactions with patients go. So now I'm gonna go into the different domains of sexual dysfunction. So I really break this down into genital symptoms, which can include um, vaginal dryness and pelvic floor dysfunction, sexual response, which includes desire, arousal, and orgasm, and then psychosocial concerns, such as body image, relationship, and intimacy. So the genitourinary syndrome of menopause is related to um, lower estrogen that can come about through a number of different changes in patients who have cancer. This can cause genital dryness, decreased lubrication, discomfort or pain with sexual activity, bleeding, decreased arousal, um, orgasm desire, irritation and burning, and also dysuria in urinary frequency. And for women who are experiencing these changes, we actually see loss of um, the thickness of the vaginal wall or vaginal atrophy, shortening of the vagina, and sometimes narrowing or stenosis of the vagina as well. There's also reduction in blood flow to the vagina. First line for treatments, which can be recommended by um, by nurses, by nurse practitioners, is to use over-the-counter vaginal moisturizers and lubricants. So many patients who are having concerns about sexual health with, with vaginal dryness don't know about these interventions, and through counseling them can really make a difference. So vaginal moisturizer is something that's used on a regular basis to maintain vaginal and vulvar moisture in the health of the tissue, regardless of sexual activity, whereas a lubricant is used to reduce friction and relieve discomfort during vaginal penetration or any kind of sexual touch. So moisturizers come in different forms. They're natural oil moisturizers that can be used as well as um, commercially available over-the-counter moisturizers as well. And then different types of lubricants include water-based, silicone-based, and oil-based, and they have different properties. For example, um, oil-based cannot be used with condoms. If patients are using silicone sex toys, then a silicone-based lubricant should not be used. Some of them will stay in the sheath, others are more sticky. Longer lasting ones are typically silicone-based or oil-based. Um, and so a patient, depending on how they are gonna utilize these, can select the most appropriate one. And then local hormones. For some patients who have cancer, use of local hormones such as vaginal estrogen is a very appropriate treatment for their genital symptoms. And here's a, a table of a number of different available um, topical um, hormone preparations. So one big question that everybody has is, are vaginal hormones safe in breast cancer? So I'm gonna briefly go over what we know, what we don't know, and how we can counsel patients. So at this time, there's no large randomized controlled trials that establish whether there's a difference in survival or outcomes in patients who use vaginal hormones. However, there's multiple observational studies that have not shown an increased risk of breast cancer. So for example, one large study showed that um, patients who used vaginal estrogen, that's the vaginal ET, did not have an elevated risk of developing breast cancer. And then in the Women's Health Initiative, patients who used the topical vaginal hormones, I'm not talking about hormone replacement therapy, did not have an increased risk of breast cancer. And then there was one study that looked at patients who had a diagnosis of breast cancer, 
and used a nested case control format, and again, did not see an increase in occurrence. So what do our um, large organizations have to say about it? So um, ASCO in their guideline states that for women with hormone positive breast cancer who are symptomatic and not responding to conservative measures, low dose vaginal estrogen can be considered after a thorough discussion of risks and benefits. The uh, ACOG or American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists similarly says data do not show an increased risk of cancer recurrence among women undergoing treatment for breast cancer or those with a history of breast cancer who use vaginal estrogen. And then the Menopause Society also says that women with estrogen positive breast cancer on aromatase inhibitors um, who have severe symptoms and have failed non-hormonal treatments may still be candidates for local hormones after review with the woman's oncologist versus switching to tamoxifen. So how do we decide um, when this is appropriate or not? So it's a very individualized decision that involves shared risk benefit decision-making with the patient. But for example, patients who are using tamoxifen, who have estrogen negative disease, who have a lower initial risk of cancer and more severe symptoms that have not responded to non-hormonal um, methods may favor the use of vaginal estrogen. The bottom line is that vaginal hormones are not contraindicated in breast cancer and may be utilized for the right patient after risk benefit discussion. So now I'm gonna go into um, a particular symptom which is called um, vestibulodynia. So the vestibule is this entry area around the vagina and some women will report pain with the initial point of penetration. And there has been a study that evaluated the use of topical lidocaine for this insertional dyspareunia. And it reduced the, the feeling of pain with vaginal penetration. So 4% aqueous lidocaine is a possible intervention that can be offered for these patients. In addition, vibrators can increase blood flow to the vagina and improve the genital health. Another really important um, issue for women who are maybe having pain with sex is pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, as you delve more into this, you'll find out that it is all about the pelvic floor. It is such an important part of our bodies and um, can have major impacts on sexual health. So the pelvic floor is um, composed of muscles that support and lift the vagina, the bladder, the rectum, and they are meant to be both strong and supportive, but also be able to relax appropriately. Pelvic floor dysfunction can come about with either an underactive or an overactive pelvic floor. And what I see a lot in patients is um, something that is pelvic pain syndrome where they may be having pain with penetration. And this would be an appropriate time to consider pelvic pain or pelvic floor dysfunction. And pelvic floor physical therapy can dramatically help these patients. So for anybody who's reporting pain with vaginal penetration, or even who has that plus issues with incontinence or constipation may benefit from pelvic floor physical therapy. So when a patient is referred to pelvic floor physical therapy, different therapies are offered, including stretching, teaching relaxation poses, yoga, breathing, and then management of symptoms, which may involve progressive vaginal dilators or um, utilization of tools such as the vaginal um, pelvic floor wand, um, trigger point massage as well. Here's an image of progressive vaginal dilators where somebody may have to start with the very smallest one available and then gradually work up to the size that's needed for comfortable penetration. Another symptom is vaginismus, which is a penetration disorder where any type of penetration can then trigger an involuntary spasm, which then feeds back to more pain. And this is something that can be treated with both pelvic floor physical therapy as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, I'm reaching the end of the talk here. So just to reach, to discuss a little bit about the female sexual response cycle, many patients will report concerns about um, the sexual response, which includes desire, arousal, and orgasm. And at this time, the recommended treatment for these issues is psychosocial counseling or referral to a sex therapist. This is not a um, formula, it's biological as well, and many hormones and other neurotransmitters feed into these sexual response, uh, sexual responses. And many of the medications that we commonly prescribe for people with cancer can have negative impacts on the sexual response. So it's always important to review the list of medications and see if there's any medications the patient is on that may be impacting 
sexual health in a negative way. And here's a chart of different antidepressants and the relative effect that they can have on sexual response. So at, that, at this point, I'm gonna wrap up um, and let's see, just touch on one final issue, which is body image. So this is another important issue for patients who have gone through cancer and cancer treatment. It's important to know this is more than just physical appearance. This is how a person feels um, involves perception, cognition, the behaviors and emotions that are related to one's body. And when um, people go through changes to their body they didn't ask for through cancer and cancer treatment, there can be negative impact on body image. That should be um, addressed through counseling. So at this point, I will um, pause and see if there's any questions. Thank you very much for listening to this talk.